Hello, world, and welcome to episode eight of our behind the scenes podcast of the upcoming feature length documentary film, God Said Give Them Drum Machines, the story of Detroit Techno. I'm your boy, Reggie Dokes, and this month we are sharing the movement story with our listeners. Movement is an international electronic music festival held in Detroit's Hart Plaza every year since 2000. It showcases the biggest electronic music DJs and producers from Detroit and all over the world. The weekend long festival brings fans on annual pilgrimages to Detroit, the techno Mecca. This entire project began by filming at movement with a couple of handheld cameras. And you know, we owe so much to this annual event. One of the first electronic music festivals in the world that has helped build, shape, and inform the God Said Give Them Drum Machines film. And we are not the only ones who have so much to thank Movement for. Movement has paved the way for worldwide electronic music festivals, such as Electric Daisy Carnival and Electric Forest. So with this episode, we bring you the sights and sounds of Detroit's Movement Festival, from the experience of the folks on the ground who celebrate techno music in the city of its birth. Hi, I'm Dave Grandison. I'm a producer on God Said Give Them Drum Machines. Um, I've offered you know, a lot of archival footage as a part of the project, um, and, and I really uh, have quite a bit of footage that actually uh, happened at uh, the original uh, Detroit Electronic Music Festival. I initially set out to start documenting the history of uh, Detroit Electronic Music due to the Detroit Electronic Music Festival. It was a catalyst for me. The first time I went, I documented the entire trip. I filmed the entire trip. I uh, made sure that, that I captured a wide range of interviews at that first festival. And um, it, it was because to me, it was such a historic homecoming. It was, you know, techno mecca. It, that was one of the first titles that we actually called the project was, you know, Techno Mecca. And it was because we were going home to Techno Mecca and it was a pilgrimage. It was a um, joyous time to actually see Detroit respecting the art form that was created there. And it allowed all of the, all of the people who had left Detroit to, to return to the city to celebrate uh, that art form. My name is Gary Graff. I'm a music journalist. I've been in Detroit since 1982. I'm writing for publications around town as well as national publications such as uh, Billboard, the New York Times Syndicate, Rolling Stone, and others. Being with something from its birth. You know, because obviously, you know, I'm not going to be at rock and roll school. Um, even the even like the garage rock scene, okay, I was around for that birth, the birth of that scene. But, you know, that's a scene that's been around for a long time. But electronic music was really something brand new that I got to see from, you know, if not day one, you know, day three, <laughs> you know, when they started doing it. My take on the Detroit music scene is that it's Detroit music scenes in the plural. Uh, what they all, you know, there is a thriving rock and roll scene, jazz, gospel, hip hop, really you, you name any genre. And there's a significant music scene in Detroit, obviously including uh, techno and electronic music. And, you know, it, there's a legacy of great music in Detroit. And it, you know, it comes really from immigration and migration. You know, the people who came from other parts of the country and other parts of the world came to Detroit primarily for work, primarily in the auto industry, but they brought their culture with them and they created 
all these cultural scenes around the city. Detroit literally was the proverbial melting pot for all kinds of music. And from that came a synthesis of musical styles that gave you Motown, that gave you the Grandy Ballroom scene at rock and roll, certainly that gave you electronic music, which came, you know, which, which came from so many different aspects of the music that came before it, that the, you know, the Belleville Three, and then everybody else who worked in the city turned it into something completely new and different than their own. Detroit's birth of techno is, it's so funny. Um, yeah, people around this city did not know what was going on. Certainly some did. You know, I listen, we went to those uh, abandoned warehouse parties, uh, you know, and certainly, certainly saw that there was an audience, that there were people who, who got it and loved this music. I mean, we went to the Music Institute. Uh, certainly and saw what was going on there so there was but it was a small it was a small part of the community you know it wasn't it wasn't competing with pine knob let's say you know the big amp the big amphitheater rock show uh, but you know isn't this the case with so many kind of musics uh, whether it's jazz or even motown there's a lot of motown story that broke first in europe and in other parts of the world you know, even better than it, even better and even bigger than it did at home. So, you know, and that, that some of that's the story of America to me. It's the story of a young nation, and we, you know, are, in pop culture, we are the lowest common denominator. We are the we are the most easily accessible. Uh, we're the sitcom and the cop show and the shoot 'em up and the blow 'em up movie, and whatever is easiest to consume and easiest to understand. And that's being a young nation. You know, whereas in other parts of the world, you know, especially Europe, they consume art differently. They experience art differently uh, in a more scholarly, in a more, in a more immersive way. And they value the nuances of an art form and of its history and legacy, you know, more, th more than we do in the United States. Ergo, they got it quicker in Europe where they're a little, shall we say, more progressive and they respected more the tradition of the music and where it come from. And, and, and therefore they appreciated the history of the music and where it comes from. And therefore they understood and valued that it came from Detroit. Even if, even if the Detroit people didn't know it was going on. Hi, I'm Bart, aka DJ Red D. I'm uh, based in uh, Ghent, Belgium. I was born in Belgium as well. And I'm a professional DJ, I'm a music producer, and I am owner of We Play House Recordings, uh, my record label that I've been running for 13 years now. I first heard Detroit Techno Probably when I first heard Detroit Techno, I didn't know it was from Detroit and I didn't know it was called Techno. But the very first time I was made aware of the fact that the music that I, I liked so much partly originated in Chicago, Detroit and New York was at a legendary Ghent record shop called Music Man, where one blessed day in 1994, I picked up a copy of Daniel Bell's Losing Control. Which to me stood out uh, from everything else I was buying and hearing that day. And, and then the, the, the sales guy said, yeah, if you like that kind of stuff, go look over there in the crates. You have like uh, Metroplex, Transmat, KMS. Those are all labels with music from Detroit, just like Daniel Bell's music is from Detroit. But it was still a bit different, but it, it, that was my starting point that led me to discover everything I know now.
what struck me when I when I was in Detroit was was the the desolation uh, of the downtown, which was now it's changed so much when I was there last time. But when I was first there, it, that was that was something that for for a guy coming from yeah a country where where everything was like. I don't know, spick and span, do you know that expression? Where everything was like clean and, and it and that was like like raw, super raw. And and it it, it was sad, but it had that 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 mesmerizing thing to it as well, which is which is I remember driving from, from the airport to downtown in, in a rental car and, and it was a really rainy day which was probably very appropriate in Detroit and 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 the whole first day the whole first impressions made me I'm, I'm, I'm not from Detroit so I can probably never fully understand but but the first four five five hours in in Detroit soaking up the the, the surroundings I had the idea that now I understand the music now I know that something that you cannot really describe feeling that was in most or almost anything coming from Detroit that was techno or, or even house, even Theo Parrish's or Moody Man stuff has a certain quality to it that I understood better after like a, a day in Detroit. That's something that I will always remember. And something that I, I tell a lot of people here uh, who are into the music from Detroit, I, I, I urge him, go there. If you want to fully understand why it's special, just go there. That's something I'll always remember. And something that, sometimes I'm sad because that first feeling is never coming back. But it's ingrained in, in me and it's, it's something that stays with me when I'm playing, when I'm making music. It'll always be there. So, you know, the culture that you find in Detroit, and again, because Detroit is a city who, you know, where any city where the cost of living is low, the arts thrive. And that is the way Detroit has been, you know, for almost 20 years now. And so the most incredible artists are there and the most incredible musicians and bands are there. So the, uh, you know, the, the mix of different cultural uh, you know, events is incredible. And of course, you know, the food is nuts. You know, you gotta, you gotta go to the restaurants. <laughs> yeah, Detroit, that's one of the things I look forward to most. You know, the Detroit Electronic Music Festival was actually one of the first electronic music festivals in the world. Um, after uh, the Detroit Electronic Music Festival, there were a wide range of other festivals that happened, but you know, techno tourism um, really started around the time that the Detroit Electronic Music Festival was born. Yeah, there there was Love Parade. You know, there there were. Um, you know, there was Glastonbury, you know, there, there were a wide variety of different festivals. There were music festivals in Europe, but electronic music festivals um, were, were pioneered by the Detroit Electronic Music Festival. You know, and Detroit Electronic Music Festival spawned, you know, festivals like the uh, CTEMF in Cape Town. You know, spawned uh, the, uh, another sister festival in, in Torino, Italy. Um, but now, Techno tourism is, is is everywhere. You have Tomorrowland, you know, Tomorrowland in Belgium, you know, one of the biggest electronic music festivals in the world. You, know, you have Untold, uh, you know, in, in Romania. You know, you have uh, Austin Beach Festival in, in Belgium. You have Cream Fills in the UK. You know, you have Mysteryland in the Netherlands. Uh, Ultra Music Festival in Miami. And of course, Electric Daisy Carnival in Las Vegas. But, you know, these are very, very large, super festivals. Detroit Electronic Music Festival remains very true to showcasing electronic music that was born in Detroit and that is 
uh, following the path of Detroit techno uh, while bringing in some pop acts, while bringing in some dope underground hip hop and, and showcasing that in a very, very curated way, the Detroit Electronic Music Festival is uh, still very much a, a cultural event that is celebrating you know, the art form of Detroit techno and it hasn't gone pop and cheesy and gimmicky like many of the super festivals have so you know it, again it, it's 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 real it's it's authentic uh and and it's detroit a big part of the movement story is that it still exists because there was there was a period of time uh, it's no longer the mid-period, but certainly after the initial blast and that great success of the Detroit Electronic Music Festival, where things got a little dire, and we were worried about it. You know, changes in leadership. Kevin Saunderson did his part. Uh, Carl Craig, uh, Derek May stepped up, you know, did their parts to try to do it. Um, a lot of people lost money you know keeping keeping the festival alive so you know it's really a tribute to when paxahal came in and you know and you you had professional organization to it which i know to some people you know this professional organization feels a little weird because you know again this is music that started in abandoned warehouses it was kind of a uh, a criminal endeavor <laughs> at one point you know with trespassing and things like that but taking it and you know and this has happened around the world too making it a real music festival a professional a music festival has ensured its its longevity maybe and that, that's a big part of the story but we should never lose track of those periods of struggle where the the electronic artists themselves the detroit electronic artists really had to step up to keep this thing alive, and, you know, there was there, that that was you know nothing short of that. That first movement, the first Detroit Electronic Music Festival, was the wake up call for the city of Detroit in terms of this thing that was born in in its own in its own backyard. I mean, when they. When they announced it, there was a lot of skepticism, a lot of a lot of raised eyebrows. Like you really, you really think you're going to fill Hart Plaza, you know, for for what's essentially been a club phenomenon, you know, a a warehouse phenomenon. And uh, damn skippy, they did it. They, you know, it was it was awesome and awe inspiring. I remember going down, you know, especially at night when you just had the packed bowl at Hart Plaza, just packed, and and everybody moving in unison, it seemed like, and you walked the streets, and the streets were full of, of techno fans, and that was a that was a real wake-up call to how popular this music was worldwide, the impact the mu that this music had made worldwide, and how much people loved this export of Detroit around the world. I mean, we knew, we knew they loved the Cubs, and they loved Motown, and they loved Bob Seger, and Mitch Ryder, and, and all of that. But, you know, electronic music, techno music had really been in the, you know, standing in the shadows, or in this case, dancing in the shadows. And it really was the that first Detroit Electronic Music Festival that showed people what, what had been going on here, and this, this little secret society and community that had been built around the music so all of a sudden detroit rock city did become detroit electronic city and people embraced it and understood it now that doesn't mean the average person in detroit started building a collection of electronic music in their house or started going to raves or anything like that but it at least brought it to the surface and you were able if you were a, a detroiter it gave you something else to pump your chest about that you know oh yeah there's there's motown boom there, yeah there's there's the mustang boom there's bob seeger boom there's techno boom 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 i mean you know and and so people understood it understood it and that that's what the great significance 
of what we now call the Movement Festival is, is that it's this celebration of something that was homegrown and homebred and created not from nothing, but at from the imaginations of some really forward thinking, diehard music fans who, cre who created something new from a lot of different pieces. Hi, my name is Azia Shine, and I'm originally from Toronto, Canada, and I run a website and a lifestyle marketing platform called Fuse Ecology. My relationship with movement as well as Fuse Ecology is we've been a media partner of the festival since it was before, before it was really movement and ever since it became movement. And so for decades now, <laughs> we've been helping to promote and support their efforts into getting the word out outside of Detroit. So like Azia pointed out, guys, a lot of us were going back and forth between calling the festival movement or Detroit Electronic Music Festival. This thing started out as Detroit Electronic Music Festival, the DEMF. And it was hard for a lot of us to say movement because a lot of us remember it as something else. A few of the techno pioneers had their hands in the early years of producing the festival, and they were vital to the festival's authenticity and survival in years when it was finding its form. Yes, I'm talking about Derek May, Kevin Saunderson, and especially Carl Craig. These guys laid the foundation. Then Paxow took over the festival in 2006, and they have been running with it ever since. The significance of Movement Detroit is pretty massive because it, you know, sure, it's just a weekend long, but it really is something that the city prepares for, I feel like, from the top of the year. And the buzz kind of continues on into the summer. I feel that it is a staple um, event. It's just, it's what you do on Memorial Day weekend. It's the kickoff for the summer. It's the kickoff for the American festival scene from the Midwest to the East because the, you know, the winter's ending and it's, it's starting to get hot. I uh, first heard about uh, Movement Festival or rather DMF was what it was called when I first heard about it through a friend uh, from Ghent uh, who was running a website called technotourist.org and I remember I was always hanging with that guy in some Belgian clubs and he was, he was him, both him and me were talking about the music from Detroit and he said, yeah, they're they now starting a festival to, to pay homage to, to, to their own sounds. And I'm going to go with, with some friends. Are you going to come with me? And, and that year, I don't know why I said no, but maybe I couldn't go. But I remember uh, very much the name DEMF. And when, like, I think two years later, I, I decided to go because I had met some people from Detroit online thanks to the 313 mailing list. Maybe some, some viewers will remember this. Uh, and then I saw the lineup. Uh, I was triggered by uh, uh, DJ mixes from Theo Parish, where there was a track by Reggie Dokes called Black Thoughts. which was something that, that just blew my mind. And I was like, I have to go to that city. I have to like get to understand why the music sounds like it sounds. And, and, and then I just basically had a hookup to like stay with a guy in the suburbs. Uh, but I just came all by myself and I just discovered Detroit. And I just went to parties and started talking to people and, 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 Certainly, uh, specifically looked up the Psychostasia party uh, where I wanted to like talk to Reggie 
And I, I do remember, I think my very first words to him was like, hi, I'm Bart from Belgium. I want you to come and play at my party. So that's that's how, how my relationship with Reggie started. And that was also my very first night in Detroit. Heart Plaza is huge because without it, I don't think that there would be a festival, right? Personally, you know, you couldn't have it on Belle Isle. It would be crazy. Um, you couldn't really have, if you had it outside of the city, it wouldn't be authentic, right? If you had it in like Ann Arbor or something like that or Pontiac. So I feel like Heart Plaza being on the river, having all the ability to have all these different stages. Obviously, it also houses many other festivals, um, you know, that Detroit does. And just, you know, the attachment to the old Cobo Hall, all of these things that obviously have are, are sort of shifting right now post COVID. But in a sense, it's like it's like um, it's like a takeover, right? It takes over Campus Martius, it takes over Woodward, you, all the bars. It, it's like literally a takeover. So the, the fact of the matter is Heart Plaza is the perfect backdrop. It's absolutely stunning, right? Of all of the, the sort of the downtown essence of it, the river, um, the fact that you have, you know, the statues and everything, but most importantly, this massive stage in the heart of Heart Plaza. Um, without that stage, just couldn't have a festival. All, the, all those little cute little stages it's it's awesome what they've done over the years truly but without that main stage i don't think that 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 festival would have that energy i plan my hotel rental car and everything months in advance um <laughs> that's me i know a lot of people that do it last minute um it is an experience. Uh, one thing, you know, to be said is Detroit's not a big city. So things get booked up really, really quickly. The Airbnbs, the cars, everything's taken. Not only is Detroit kind of a bit of a smaller market in just that sense of having the amount of hotels or whatever that maybe a city like New York or Chicago or LA has. It's also um, extremely self-contained and the core of Detroit is also pretty small. So, you know, it's not one of those cities where you want to stay outside of of the action. You kind of want to stay internally. So it's become a pilgrimage. It's absolutely something I, over the years that I've planned out quite well. And it's also, um, you know, quite frankly, I think extremely important to the city. I mean, I don't know the numbers offhand, but I'm sure the amount of money that they make through tourism is more than any other festival that, you know, they have in, in the city of Detroit. Because again, people come in from Japan, Germany, um, all over the United States, Canada, of course. And so it's, it's really special. And I feel that um, a lot of people feel that it is a, indeed a pilgrimage that they make for Memorial Day weekend. I've gone almost every year since uh, the year 2001. I didn't go to the first DEMF, but I've gone almost every other year. I've And I've been, you know, either I've, I've booked talent, I've been involved, I've done PR, or I've just straight up been like just a marketing partner and promotional partner and a fan, you know, enjoying the music and having very little sleep and being very tired by Monday. Monday's brutal. You know, one of the things that I always can count on when I go to the festival is I'm not going to get any sleep. And so some years I spend a lot, get an incredible hotel room, and I'm never there. And I'm there literally between uh, like 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. Then we go to breakfast and we're out till uh, <laughs> you know, 6, 7, 8 the next night. So, you know, the biggest problem that I would run into is when I got home, I slept for like two days because I was exhausted because I just didn't stop while I was at Detroit. And so, hey, you when you go to the D for movement, you're not going to sleep. Don't think you're going to sleep. So, you know, hey, get whatever room you can. Crash on somebody's couch. Do what you got to do, but be there and uh, you'll, you won't regret it. As I was you know, reviewing footage, I was, you know, hearing, you know, people talking about, you know, all the parties and it's probably the most frustrating part 
of of going to movement was that I could not go to every party and that you had the best DJs in the world competing for your attention. So <laughs> you had to pick wisely or you're not going to get into the club where the dopest DJ is. You know, so you you hit a few early sets and you you tried to every cat you run into all the DJs you know, you're like, "Yo, what time you on, man? What time you on?" You know, you try to get there at that time. When he's off, you bounce to the next party, but you gotta be at the main event early enough to get in the main event. Or if you show up at one o'clock, you ain't getting in. You show up at two o'clock, you probably aren't getting in. Three, you'll get in, but the main act um, is, it, you know, is it may have already gone on at one or two. So it, it's always a crapshoot. It's all, I mean, you know, that's the fun of it, but it, it also it can be frustrating because there's just too many parties. The festival, whether it was DMF or movement, created what we call techno tourism. You know, it it made Detroit a destination for all these fans around the world. And you see them; they come from Europe, they come from Asia. You know, obviously, they haven't come uh, in the past couple of years because of the pandemic. But they, it's it is a pilgrimage. You know, this Detroit becomes for a weekend a mecca. Uh, for this for this kind of music and they they get that they're in the birthplace of a significant wing of the electronic dance music genre you know this is they that they are in the birthplace of techno and they really embrace the idea that what they're hearing here what they hear at this festival is authentic and it is you know it comes from the place it's presented one of the phenomenons i find at the festival every year is when I, when you look at the various stages, the, if we want to call them the tourists, but the, the, the domestic tourists are the ones who come out for the big things, you know, and are the ones at the bowl. You go to the more Detroit centric stages and it's all the people from other countries and foreigners because they want to see real, it's like people going to the Motown Museum. They want to be on terra firma. They want to see and hear the real Detroit techno music. And that's what they think they're getting from from the, those artists. And that's what they are getting from those artists. But it's fun, it is funny to see that. You know, if you're from Detroit, you want to see the people who are coming in from out of town and out of the country perform. Whereas if you're somebody who made the pilgrimage to Detroit to be in the birthplace of techno music, you're going to the smaller stages to hear the Detroit ads. You know, if it has Detroit after it on the program, that's where you go, that's the one you circle, and that's where you go. So that, that's kind of, that's fun to see, but unquestionably, the festival brings people from around the world uh, to Detroit, you know, to consume that part of the city. You know, I don't know that they're going to, you know, coming out to the birds or they're going to the museums or any of the other cultural things. Lord knows that between the festival itself and then all the adjacent parties and the after parties and things, you know, the music's enough to keep everybody going at least 23 hours a day. But they're here, they're seeing Detroit, you know, and they're seeing Detroit really those, those days and nights of the festival that area of the city looks fabulous, you know, especially at night when, uh, you know, when the lights are flashing on the buildings and you have people, you know, like R Richie Houghton or when Kraftwerk was here who used the landscape, used the buildings as part of their show. You know, it really, it really shows Detroit in its best light. This is an archival clip um, you know, that, that we're pulling out of the vaults. Uh, and it actually was, was used in the, the Techno Mecca trailer, which was you know, one of the first uh, teasers that we created um, for, you know, for the film God Said Give Them Drum Machines, you know, what has become the film God Said Give Them Drum Machines. But it features an incredible little statement by Reggie Dokes. And you know, he really breaks down um, you know, the vibe and, and the heart of what this festival is all about and what we're actually uh, you know, celebrating and, and, uh, and, and really reminiscing on. These kids 
uh, who are like 17, 15, they have no idea that Black Hands created Detroit style techno. And that's why this festival is so important because history needs to be told like it should. First time I was at Movement must have been 2001, I think. 2001, and then, then I skipped a couple years. And then I went back in 2011. Uh, I took my girlfriend on a, a trip to, to Detroit, New York, Chicago, to like see the roots of, of what, what, what the music I, I'm, I'm spending my time with. Uh, and then when I was there again in 2011, I realized why the fuck did I, why didn't I come more often in, 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 in the past? So then ever since then, I think every two years, and actually when I was there last in 2019, I decided I'm coming every year, at least once a year, I have to go to Detroit. Mm -hmm. But then of course, we all know what happened, but I'm pretty sure as soon as traveling and, and meeting people again is a bit more relaxed, I'm, I'll, I'll be there every year for sure, with or without movement. Okay, this this is dope. So, you know, Movement 04, think about this lineup on the Movement stage. You had Derek Plastico, you had Jeannie Hopper, you had Osun Lade, you had Terrence Parker. That was until 10 on the second night, Saturday night. On the High Tech Soul stage, you had Garth Trinidad, you had Amp Fiddler, you had wow yeah i mean you had j lib which was j dilla and mad lib with peanut butter wolf okay like think about that lineup insane <laughs> and then um you had a music institute stage on the music institute stage on saturday you had um mike grant d win okay d win the creator of the music institute or one of the creators of the music institute um, you had on the underground stage, you had Sao Principo, you had, wow, you had, you know, Lego Wall, you had BMG from Ectomorph, you had, um, you know, DJ Tracks, okay? So, like, all these stages were rocking like that all weekend long. I mean, Without doubt, movement is on a par with just about any festival you, you'd mention. It's got a huge base and a huge platform, and, it, and it's so well known. A truly international dance music festival. And I think that that's really special because it's not just like some rinky dink weekend in Detroit, it's like a true experience. It's a different flavor of festival because it's not a camping festival. It's an urban type of festival. So that gives it its own unique, unique flavor. And, you know, part of part of that uniqueness is it does then allow the audience to experience Detroit as a city, in addition to being here for the music festival. I feel like Paxahau has always tried to sort of do something different every year and not every festival does that some festivals are just like okay here's another year let's go let's roll out whereas i feel like movement is really like the coachella of the midwest even if movement doesn't always get mentioned in the same breath as bonnaroo or coachella or blast and Mary or some of those others i think in terms of reputation and footprint impact it's it's every bit the equal in these festivals i mean you can't go to movement and not have fun even if you don't know a lick about electronic music really just because of the crap i mean you know you do have probably the most unicorns in one place on earth for those three days as you will anywhere else
the people you see in Detroit at the Movement Festival are everyone from six to 66, okay? We, you know, and everybody's vibing. Completely transgenerational, right? Like all types of races, all types of people. You walk down, you know, Hart Plaza and you will see, you know, everybody. all creeds, all cultures, all races, all sexualities, all gender identifications. And I think that's what makes it really special because that's something that you don't see at a Coachella or, you know, at a North Shore Chicago festival or even a jazz festival for the most part. It's a mixing pot of different types of music. So the age group is wide. I love seeing little kids, the babies, the, the six, seven year olds, the toddlers dancing. The, the circle forms around the little kid when he starts going and you love it because you see him you know, getting his vibe. You know, it's, it's, I love that most because I know that there's a new uh, generation that's evolving to love the same music that I grew up loving. You know, I can say that I, I truly feel that all music is for everybody. But, you know, electronic music definitely is for everybody and, and the festival is certainly for everybody because if you're not digging what's going on on the big stage you have three or four other places where you can go and hear hear something different i'd love to talk to you a little bit about my favorite moment of all festival history now there definitely have been some incredible moments you know i i i loved it when you know craft work came you know i love it when uh you know some of the bigger names showed up but the biggest moment for me was when i got to see jeff mills in front of a huge throng of detroiters and the love that he was given at the first big festival he has ever appeared in in Detroit, which was uh, 2001 at the DEMF. It was a homecoming. It was a electric feeling in the crowd. Everybody waited and was ready for Jeff to return home and Jeff ripped it up. Jeff did everything we wanted him to do. He, he he read the crowd. He knew exactly what we wanted and people lost their minds. It, you know, it, I've never seen a show like that. And uh, I will always remember, uh, you know, again, Jeff, Jeff, giving you a little bit of the wizard, giving you turntablism, giving you the, the depth of, uh, you know, his, his, you know, his incredible catalog that has been born since he's you know, moved on um, from, from Detroit. But again, the feeling, the vibe, the, the, the true uh, Detroit nature of, of Jeff Mills uh, returning home, the wizard returning home is a moment that I will always remember. I think a, a, a favorite moment for me uh, with this festival was when I was actually uh, a participant in the festival. So I had the great experience and great fortune to um, play live with Divinity on percussion alongside the master, Jerry the Cat, uh, and Piranha Head, uh, who had formed a band for this uh, particular situation. So we played um, a couple of uh, Divinity's uh, hits in house music live. And I was able to, again, be a part of that experience uh, on stage. And that, and that was phenomenal for me. Um, you know, just being a musician versus being a, a, a DJ. And then the other great moment for me uh, was when I did DJ uh, the festival and I think this is when Carl uh, was running it and um, I remember the stage that I was playing on um, was one of the stages like off to the side but kind of down around the corner in a, in a little bowl or pit if you will but the lineup was incredible man it was it was Victor Duplay 
uh, Francois K. I mean, I it was some heavy hitters playing on this stage, and I was DJing um, uh, on the same stage. So, you know, I remember getting ready uh, or getting prepared for my set, and um, Francois K. and one of his sound people uh, walked up to me, and man, they were just like so nice and, and humble and, and I remember Francois saying Reggie look forgive me man but you know I like playing on my own mixer and so if it's okay with you can we get all this set up you can play all my stuff and 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 we're good I was like man are you kidding me you know when a DJ has his own sound man that's some serious shit so of course you know I acquiesced and you know me and Francois K uh, have been cool ever since. That was truly a blessed and great moment for me as a DJ. Wow. Yeah, I was I was reviewing footage of the first festival and there's and and there is a scene where we're in the hotel and friends are getting ready and you know that's the pre-party the pre-movement um ritual is you go from room to room in your hotel and you check out what everybody's putting on and uh, yeah you'll see the most incredible um ways that people are expressing themselves to go to this festival because you know you'll have um you'll have sisters putting on goth corsets you'll have um ravers who are at that time where you're embracing the neon colors were giving you the you know the the top you know the, the the furry boots giving you you know the the the, the complete rave package with the the plastics and the uh you know the the, the neon uh, hoops and then you have the house heads who are going to you know give you whatever the latest most chic streetwear is and you know you've got the b-boys who are giving you b-boy style you know and you've got the detroiters the straight up detroiters who you might run into a cat in a purple suit with purple gaiters on and a purple bossolino <laughs> so you know you've got this mixture but you don't see clashes everybody gets along you respect that the cat in the purple suit the bossolino and the gaiters is getting his house groove on and you're like okay we 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 may not be from the same hood but we but i respect that you get it and you know what's up and and your cabarets are probably rocking the same tracks that we're happening at our party clubs and so you know we we find that common bond and you know we love it so you know the the styles that emerge are, are pure detroit and that's what detroit's all about you know, that anywhere i go everybody says detroiters are always some of the best around and if you come to the movement you're gonna see all the most current styles and and you know you, you walk away knowing yeah you know, what what what's hot what i'm always telling friends uh about detroit and always the reasons i'm i'm telling them to go there is because I've, I've played all over the world. I've met people from all over the world. I've, I'm, I'm searching music from all over the world. But if I'm in Detroit, or if I'm playing stuff from Detroit, the defining thing for me is realness. Could be, could be a hipster word if you leave it to resident advisor. But if you're there, it is not. Uh, I've met so many people from Detroit. After the first time I came to Detroit and first Reggie and Theo came to play at my parties in Belgium, a whole bunch of people from Detroit started coming. Uh, my grand, Mike Huckabee, Rick Wade, uh, Frankie Junkai, who is not from Detroit, but who was working for Underground Resistance, Kevin Saunderson, Derek May, you name him and and almost every time that i met somebody new from the music scene in detroit i was struck by how real they are how 
straightforward they are. I always have a feeling that there's no, they're not hiding stuff. And when I got to know the city, I, I can I can I can click those two things together. And 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 if you if you focus on 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 music and the environment you've got, there is no lying. There is no prettiness to be put on top in order to sell. It's just the the, 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 the thing that strikes you, the realness that that's in the city, the, the, the roughness that's in the city, just makes that if I if I hear a Detroit piece of music, it feels honest. That's it. I don't think I can describe it any any better. As we all know, the coronavirus pandemic, you know, has affected uh, many of our lives. We've lost uh, a lot of friends and, you know, and, and the world continues to face many obstacles uh, in Paxile. Uh, you know, had to cancel their in-person movement festival in Hart Plaza for the second year in a row, you know, but fortunately uh, they were able to pivot and and create a more accommodating in-person event at the world famous TB Lounge in Detroit. They call it the micro movement and it's an event that is going to be streaming virtually on Paxile TV uh, and Twitch TV. So, you know, shout out to Morin and the Paxile team for keeping the Detroit love going, you know, on a weekend that is important to Detroiters and, and techno lovers all over the world. Yeah, the festival has unfortunately, you know, had to bow to the pandemic like so many others. Uh, I do. I applaud Paxile for their abundance of caution you know they are they are not taking chances they know what the situation is they want to they they want to have a safe event you know for all the right reasons too i mean certainly if you're an event organizer you have to sit down and think if something goes wrong with my event you know i'm in trouble but they're also doing it to keep their audience safe they're, they they it's not it's not just about the commercial and business aspects about it they you know this is a company that cares about its audience and wants its audience to be safe wants its event to be safe and to be able to continue hopefully forever so you know kudos to them for that they're making all the right decisions you know paxa has also done a wonderful job in the virtual world of uh you know non-stop my phone goes off seemingly every day with hey we're we're live now with so and so or such and such uh they did a good virtual festival uh last year and you know they're keep they're keeping the audience engaged as best they can uh, it's a challenge i do feel that electronic fans are maybe going to be the first audience that come back and moths hopefully safe but you know when you think about it masks are part of so many of these outfits anyway People are, this is an audience that's used to having their faces covered. They're going to come back enthusiastically. Yeah, they're going to, they're going to be ready to dance and party and be at live music events w without question. So we just have to wait. One of the silver linings of the pandemic is there's been no shortage of opportunities to, as Billy Idol would say, be dancing by yourself or dancing with yourself. From D Nice's parties on to what we just talked about, Paxa How doing, you can 24 seven, you can find some sort of dance thing going on in the virtual world and, and have a little bit of fun uh, with it. And, you know, kudos to that community for keeping everybody engaged and, and really providing a much needed respite from you know, from the tension you know if you can throw something on and even if you're not a great dancer but it's it's on in the background and you're bobbing your head your head around the house that that's been a big help
So guys, we hope you enjoyed our eighth episode of God Said Give Them Drum Machines behind the scenes podcast. And, you know, don't forget to follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you stream your podcast. We are there. OK. And also, don't forget to tune in to Paxile's Twitch streams and you know continue giving them love through these virtual times. You know, we appreciate you all uh, for supporting our independent filmmaking journey. A uh, special shout out to Philip in Ireland, Jonathan in the UK, Carolyn in Michigan. Uh, for their merch purchases uh, you know we really appreciate that and you know don't forget to head over to uh, our gsgedm.com forward slash shop website i'll say that again gsgedm.com forward slash shop uh, you know we have a 20 percent off sale still going so you know head on over there and and, and see what you love and please support us also, the music that you've been hearing during this episode is music from uh, my current project that is out now called I Heard Love. And, you know, you can find that at reggiedokes.bandcamp.com. Thank you so much. Also, uh, we need to give a uh, special shout out to Azia Shane, Gary Graff, DJ Red D and Music Origins Project for sharing their movement stories with us. It was truly, truly, truly informational and entertaining. And, you know, check out musicorigins.org to learn more about the Detroit Techno 101 course, which is helping Detroit techno enthusiasts and students around the world to learn about the history of techno and its birthplace in Detroit. Also, We've got to give a shout out to uh, EPM music team, uh, Oliver, Addy, and, and Jonas. Shout out to Output, the sound design company out of LA. Big thanks to Fusicology, Asia, Amy. We appreciate you both. Guys, stay updated with us on Facebook and Instagram at God Said Give Them Drum Machines. We can't wait to share the film with you. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next month.